Uh, uh, well, there we go. Uh, there is, and of course, there's no one better to speak on this topic than Catherine Reynolds Lewis, who recently authored the book, The Good News About Bad Behavior, Why Kids Are Less Disciplined Than Ever and What to Do About It. Um, based on the most read article ever published by Mother Jones Magazine, the book documents a new model of discipline for a generation of children who are, as I'm sure many of us would agree, out of control. So uh, I, I will just say that, um, you know, there, there's so many um, impressive accomplishments and I could spend a lot of our time reading them. I'm going to cut to the last part of my introduction, which just says that Catherine and her partner, Brian, are the proud parents of three children. So she is qualified in a very hands-on way. So thank you and welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much, David. And thanks to Rabbi Serkman, Jane Sable Friedman for inviting me to speak and Raja and David for being here in the room supporting this uh, event. I'm really grateful to be here with you virtually uh, and to speak at Yom Kippur because so many of us are in a more reflective mood and hopefully open to some new ideas. And um, some of you, depending on the age of your kids, may be wondering, is it too late, right? Have, is, has the boat sailed already to, to do any, any difference with these kids? And I'll just share an incident from my book talk when I was on tour with the good news about bad behavior. I had a mom call in, I was on the Pete Dominic show, and I had a mom call in saying, is it too late? My daughter, <clears throat> you know, she's, she's living in the basement and she's really out of control and she's 36. And I'll say to you what I said to her, it's never too late. It's never too late to um, learn some new ideas, to transform your parenting or to pick up one or two, uh, two tips. So um, I'm really just uh, excited to be here and have this conversation. I hope it will be a conversation. Feel free to put things into the, um, the chat box if you have questions. And <clears throat> I've got a lot of material. I will make my slides available as uh, after the talk. So don't feel you need to screenshot or take notes or anything. So I want to start by just acknowledging that we are all coming into this space together from different places. You may be feeling cleansed and purified and ready to go, or maybe you're feeling sad because the holidays are still not exactly the way we're used to. So I want to just invite you to give yourself the gift of the next 34 minutes together to give your full attention to this conversation and to really be here with us to monotask in a way that on Yom Kippur we do that we don't always do in our regular lives. So I come to the perspective of kids behavior as the author of this book, The Good News About Bad Behavior. I spent five years trying to understand what's going on with kids today and um, looking at the data about kids' unprecedented levels of anxiety, depression, ADHD, um, and I used to spend the first half of this talk making the case that this is real, but over the last 18 months, I think we've all really seen the reality of the mental health crisis that we all are dealing with, and especially our young people. Um, and I'll just share one slice of the book um, that I, I found really interesting when I went to Columbia University to the Developmental Effective Neuroscience Lab to ask the, the scientists there to judge my parenting. So not everyone would do this, right? To, to ask scientists to take a look under the hood and see if I'm doing a good job. But I really wanted to understand what the forefront of neuroscience is understanding about kids' development. Here on the slide, you can see me and my daughter, Ava, and we have EKG leads on our uh, chests that are measuring our heart rate and they even um, measuring our stress response, our breathing. And they even at this lab take a, a sample of saliva to measure our cortisol level, which is a rough proxy for stress. Because they're looking at how kids learn about emotions, about self-regulation and about stress from their parents. And what they're finding is really fascinating that after just a minute or two sitting in this room together, my daughter and I start to have synchronized breathing. We, our heart rates start to sync up, that there's all this subconscious connection and regulation going on between parent and child on the physiological level. <clears throat> so they found that kids can actually calm themselves better if their parent is in the room with them. They perform better on tests 
This is not an excuse to go into the school and follow your kid around or to sit in on the SAT, but it's just a really interesting um, evidence of how powerful our connections are with our kids. And the implications for us as parents are pretty profound that if we have a kid who is yelling, who is defiant, who is sad, who's just like defeated, it's really natural for our bodies to feel that as well. So if we have a child who's yelling or screaming, our heart rate starts to speed up. We want to yell back. And if we do, it can easily cycle into this spiral of them becoming less regulated. We're less regulated. Suddenly everyone is crying or screaming and nobody is making good choices using the prefrontal cortex of their brains, which is where we do our thinking and planning and our sort of higher order level of decision making. So it's important for us as parents to know that our own ability to manage our behavior, our thoughts and emotions is the foundation for our kids' ability to do that. So no pressure, right? <laughs> Since we're all living in this very um, still uncertain time, it's, it's not always easy to do that. And yet it's more important now than ever. So I'm not sharing this as sort of a guilt trip um, or, you know, to, to try to make you feel even worse about yourself than you may feel on Yom Kippur, but just to, to share that it's really important to do this kind of self-regulation ourselves as an adult. And if I share a suggestion in the next half hour that seems like aspirational or I'm not even there yet, Catherine, I am just surviving, please do not let it add to your stress. Just bookmark it for later consideration. So instead of a no way, make it just a no not now. So um, this is what I learned at Columbia when I became a, a guinea pig in this lab, um, that kids are really so attuned to us. So this conversation has to really start with us. So there's only three things I'm going to talk about today. Parenting in a pandemic is taking care of yourself in ways that are compassionate and planful, enforcing healthy routines for your whole family. So brainstorm with the kids to create a family routine that includes the essentials for physical and mental health. And yes, we aim high on Yom Kippur more than any other day. We are aspirational. We want to fix all the mistakes of the last year and do better and enrich our kids' lives and, you know, do that charity project or have some extra playtime or, you know, really knuckle down in school. And right now we need to accept the reality that the basics are good enough, right? So the basics of taking care of ourselves, being there for our kids is the most important thing because ultimately um, what your kids need is you, right? That's all they really need is your non-reactive presence, your honesty when you're struggling or stressed or sad or scared, and depending on your kids' ages, this is not going to be sort of open the doors and like let it all out on them. So you're not going to always share the full truth or depth of your fear, but at least modeling how we accept some uncertainty and anxious fe feelings. And, and most of all, our playful spirit and enjoyment of them as children. That's so important in this challenging and uncertain time, we need to be the confident leaders of our families. So if you just come back to anything, it's these three things to sort of take care of yourself, figure out the routines that work and stick to them, and then find joy where you can. Um, <clears throat> and I call this my bare minimum parenting standards. So I was always a little skeptical of self-care. I'm not a bubble bath person. I am not a like candle person. But when I talk about self-care, it's really the things we know from biology that will help us thrive. Or on the converse, the things when we forget and we neglect this, that we start to get into a negative feedback loop. So um, yes, it's not always easy to make care for ourselves a priority. We may have to set limits with our work or our volunteer obligations and create those boundaries or ask for help from a partner or other family member, but it's really important to ruthlessly prioritize, right? To think back when your baby, when you had a baby, newborn, right? There was so little free time that you used it really Really wisely. So we're going back to the basics. And, um, you know, you can read the slide easily. I think that um, you know, the first three are sort of um, obvious, but we don't always do them. Connecting with community is one of those things that I hope we're all doing today. We're doing that in the Zoom room. And it's so important to really be um, able to reach out and to feel that sense of belonging and to limit triggers. So here I'm talking about 
the Netflix binge, right? It's fine to, you know, distract ourselves, but when it tips over into numbing, that's when we want to limit it. Um, obviously the sort of alcohol, the other substances that may help us when they start to become a crutch, we want to be careful. And I put people on this list because we all have these people in our lives where after an hour of talking to them, you suddenly feel fat, lazy, and incompetent as a parent right? Where their kid is learning Greek and has built an aqueduct in Colombia, and your child is just, you're happy when they take a shower on a regular basis. So pay attention to the things in your life that are feeding you and pay attention to the things in your life that maybe you want to cut back on. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I the last bullet point, okay, the last bullet point here is um, my invitation to just figure out what works for you. So these are the sort of building blocks. And then there's all these wonderful ideas out there, whether it's um, some dancing in your kitchen, reading a book by yourself, it's sort of a choose your own adventure, just play and figure out what is it that helps you restore and gain that sense of capacity so that you can be there for your kids. And um, I, I encourage you to invite you to ask these questions sort of pay attention. How do I feel during it? How do I feel afterwards? Is this something that is building my resiliency? Because we all need to be resilient, right? The school year has barely started. I don't know about you, but I'm just every day I'm crossing my fingers that it goes well and the year ahead is uncertain. So we need to become sort of the rubber floors and walls of a bouncy house so that we can just bounce back right up after adversity. And again, to find that courage to lead as our as leaders of our family as a, from a place of courage and not fear. So what about our kids? So depending on the age and temperament and number of your kids, you may be having a very different experience over the last 18 months. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's just, I've heard so much from um, educators and parents that suddenly this year, the ninth graders seem like seventh graders and the kindergartners aren't sometimes even potty trained. There's just so much variety compared with where you think you should be. So just, I would say with the kids, the same things apply to them as to us. They need sleep, healthy food, exercise and fresh air, and that connection. So um, when we do these things, we're, we're modeling for our kids that they're important. So sleep isn't just good for physical health. It's also good for mental health. It boosts your immune system. Um, exercise, it can be, you know, actual sports, or it can be a family dance party or a spin bike or YouTube drills. And sort of, I just keep suggesting things to my children to figure out what will work and what will stick. Sometimes they say yes, and I just keep inviting. I do kick my kids. I have teenagers. They would much rather be in their cave than out for a walk, but I just always invite, kick them out once in a while. And I hope here, I'm not really talking for substances about alcohol and drugs, we hope, but even things like sugar, caffeine, things that are dysregulating for our kids just as much as they are for us. Um, screens are always a very popular topic whenever I talk about parenting, and it's this ongoing dynamic system of helping our kids to find their limits with screens. Um, and um, you'll notice what I didn't look here is, I, I didn't mention here, I didn't mention homework. I didn't mention online school. I didn't mention academics. That is not gonna be the goal this year, right? It's it, kids are all different places depending on their experience in the pandemic and it's gonna sort them itself out. And any child who has one adult in their life who is a stable, supportive source of, um, of comfort and source of mentoring and modeling is going to thrive. And there's just decades of research showing that. So we want to really focus on what is the progress, what are kids able to do and not so much on where they should have been if it had not been for this pandemic. So same questions for our kids. We're going to help them learn to ask the same questions. It's fun to be on Instagram scrolling and maybe it's great for 20 minutes. And then after two hours, you just want to puke and you feel ugly and you have no friends. So you're, you're going to encourage them to just pay attention. Is Minecraft great for an hour, but if you spend the whole morning, you forgot to eat and you're suddenly cranky and you have a headache. So we're going to help them to get that feedback loop developed as well. When they do need a spring break, maybe they need to play with a pet or go outside and throw a ball around or you know do something physical um, and help them to understand. Because ultimately our goal is that at 18, we pat them on the back, shove them out the door and they can do all this by themselves. 
So this is the basics, right? It's the bare minimum parenting standards, and we still have to run our families, right? So what about the rules? This is a day in my kitchen uh, in the last 18 months, and sometimes it does feel like we're in this endless cycle of cooking and cleaning and managing and reminding Um And for me, when I became a parent, I had spent my whole career as a journalist based in the Washington DC area. So I was talking to other adults. I was covering Congress and the White House and um, talking to CEOs. And so when I had a baby, I actually had never changed a diaper. I was learning this all from scratch. And when I thought about enforcing rules, I thought about the tools that my parents used to get me to do something that I didn't wanna do, right? That's the carrot or the stick. It was this first instinct that I had to motivate my kids through a reward or punishment. And after spending five years um, doing the research, uh, following psychologists and educators around, I learned that unfortunately we have to throw these out the window. There are reams of scientific papers showing that research, un, uh, research showing that rewards undermine our intrinsic motivation. It is just unfortunately one of these truths of lies that if we are paid to do something or we're given a bribe to do something, we discount the value of that activity. So very simple example of one of the experiments, there was a a group of scientists who gave an unfamiliar yogurt drink to participants in the study. And one group was just given the drink to try and asked to rate how tasty it was. The The other group was paid to take the drink and then again asked to rate it. And the people who had been paid to try this new food rated it less enjoyable than the people who were just offered it. So whenever we give a reward, we need to be aware that we are undermining intrinsic interest. Doesn't mean that we never do it, right? I have given gum for a smile in a photograph, right? Sometimes you just do it, but we wanna really do as much as we can to rely on this as little as possible. Um, As for punishment, right, the stick, Punishment harms our relationship with our kids. It just does. It shows them that I'm the boss of you and I'm going to make you do what I want. And ultimately what that does is create power hungry children because we're sending them the message, the person with the most power gets to say have the last word. And again, this is not a guilt trip or any um, sort of shame or blame that if you've used these in the past, if you use them this morning, uh, times are just changing. These are the tools that I grew up with, but they're not tools that work now. Um, And instead we need to find new ways to help our kids manage their behavior, emotions and thoughts on their own. Because um, as I found in my research for the book, kids aren't learning it naturally the way that they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. We have unprecedented levels of anxiety, depression, ADHD, autism, suicidality, because our kids need more than what maybe we got when we were growing up. The good news is that there are so many road-tested research-backed models of teaching kids to manage their behavior, emotions, and thoughts, to teach them to self-regulate that I studied for five years. I'm just going to touch on them a little bit. But the most fundamental thing that I took away from the five years of research in my book is that we need to take a scientist mentality when our kids are acting up. So when your kids are not cooperating, it's obviously inconvenient and frustrating. And it's very tempting to be like, this is a problem. They're not putting on their shoes. They're not doing their homework. They're not going to shul with me, right? Which actually happened to me in the last week um, when my teenager decided, nah, didn't need all those services. So it's tempting to just want to like force them. And instead, um, we want to take this as a sign that there's just something different needed. Maybe the environment isn't working for them. Maybe we need different routines. Maybe they need a little bit more control or power. And if we can be a scientist who's curious and experimenting, we can partner with our kids and and find what works for them. The alternative is we start to catastrophize. If they're not doing this today, then they're not gonna do X tomorrow and they're gonna fail out of school and they'll be living in a van down by the river in 10 years, right? And that's not a path that, that needs to happen in our minds or reality. And the more we catastrophize and make a small thing into a huge thing, the more locked in we're each gonna become in our oppositional positions. So um, what, we, what, what I've learned in the book and I, and I, and I do in my own family is we, we really rely on routines and agreements as opposed to the parent directing, bribing, threatening the rewards or punishments. So to start any routine, we wanna invite our kids' perspective. 
Hey, it seems like homework's not going great. Hey, it seems like at dinner time you guys are on your screens. We need to do something different. So here are our priorities as a family, right? We all need to be healthy. We all need to sleep. We need connection time. We need to get the work of the house done. So what would work for you? You want to share your concern. You brainstorm a trial. Maybe try out this new way for a week, and um, and then revisit it. And it's always important whenever you come together. Uh, we do this in a weekly family meeting um, to 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 discuss a problem that you also agree on the consequences because when you're brainstorming often our kids will be super willing and they're like oh yeah piece of cake I'll clean up as soon as I get home from school I'll hand over my phone and then if it doesn't happen we always want to have a consequence that's planned in advance um, and for those of you who are like okay my child would never want to even brainstorm this you can always I, you know, say, I really want your perspective. I want you to help me decide this. And if we can't de decide together, I'm going to have to decide alone for our family. But you always wanna start by encouraging them to be part of the agreement discussion. In terms of consequences, this is the golden rule for consequences that allow them to really be learning opportunities and not punishments. So the best teaching of all is when there is zero parental intervention. And the example of that is they forget their lunch and they feel hungry, right? That gives them the experience, that feedback loop of, oh, these are my actions and this is the consequence. But we don't always have that ability, right? So sometimes we wanna come up with a logical consequence that is related to the child's action or choice. It's reasonable in scope, it's revealed in advance so they're not taken by surprise and it's respectful. So we're not gonna blame or shame. And we're also gonna respect ourselves as parents. We're not gonna be doormats who run to the school with a lunch every day when they forget it. So an example of this would be, if your bike is left out, it could get rained on, it could get rusty, it could get stolen. We don't want bikes left out. So maybe a consequence could be you lose the bike for a week. It's something that you know, helps them to learn to take better care of that bike and to, to be more responsible. And whenever we're delivering consequences, the tone and voice a voice and our body language are so important, as well as our intention, because our kids know us so well, that if there's a little bit of I told you so in it, then that will get them engaged in a conflict with us as opposed to just focusing on, oh, how am I going to remember to bring my bike in? Or how am I going to remember that sweatshirt? Or how am I going to calm down instead of fighting with my sibling? So as we start to implement any new routine, sleep is a great place to start. Um, I also, if you're sort of interested in doing this, I also think it's a great opportunity to apologize to your kids. And what better day than Yom Kippur to, 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 to really apologize sincerely. I have been bossing you around too much. I've been nagging you. I haven't taken your opinion into consideration. Let's start some new family routines so that we all know what to expect. And I'm not just ordering you around, you know, put them on the wall instead of you being in charge, let the routine be the boss. Um, and as an example of this, I wanna of course go back to screen time. So this is a cartoon called Reply All that's syndicated in the Washington Post. And my sister-in-law um, <clears throat> created this. And so she made a character based on me. This is Kim, uh, her my alter ego. And um, so I did not write this. This is not a scene from my life, but it's um, certainly calls, calls to mind the difficulty many of us have with managing screen time. So um, it's a dynamic process when it comes to screens. The two areas I would encourage you to limit are having screens in the bedroom. So if your kids have to work there, or do, do homework there, that could maybe be a time limited uh, period. But certainly by the end of the day, screens should have a bedtime because nothing good happens on TikTok after 10 o'clock at night. Um, you know, we don't want our kids sort of up all hours. So if our, their screens get a bedtime and our screens get a bedtime, doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing, that's going to help um, to build that foundation of sleep and healthy routines that we want for our kids. And whenever we um, are talking about responsibilities, consequences, we, we want to use a framework that whenever you take on more responsibilities in the home or for yourself, you're going to gain more freedom. So we tie privileges to responsibilities that our kids demonstrate. And you start where you are. So at one point, we had a family agreement about screens and the screens were disappearing from where they were plugged in. So my husband found this humane mousetrap and our kids' phones went in the mousetrap at night so that they couldn't disappear. So you may need to get extreme, but uh, after a few months of this, we were able to, to get rid of the mousetrap and our kids now 
plug in their phones at night and, and they stay there until morning. So we wanna start with a family agreement. We wanna use the consequences and follow through and try not to demonize screens because we certainly use them. They're really important tools and they really can be super um, addictive. So I'm gonna go through the next few slides a little bit quickly, but I promise I'm gonna share all of this with the temple so that you can um, look at it more leisurely. When I was doing the reporting for my book, uh, I looked at so many different models for teaching kids self-regulation, for teaching them to manage their thoughts, behavior, and emotions. And all of the models that I looked at shared three different elements, connection with an adult, communication in a way that builds self-regulation, and a focus on capability building. So the first of these connection is possibly what the deepest human need that separates us from you know, all other mammals on this planet is that we really need to belong and, and to feel that we're connected to the people who are important in our lives. So you may be disrupted from your usual high holidays routine, right? It can, it, it's easy to feel like this just doesn't feel satisfying. So our kids also can, can feel this sense of like a loss of control or a loss of belonging and giving them an opportunity to contribute is such an building block of mental health. So here you see my daughter Ava helping to build a bookshelf. And when, when you start with these small steps, every time she walks by that bookshelf, she knows, hey, I built that. I'm capable. I did something. I helped my family. Um, and, and whenever we have an opportunity to train our kids to do these small things, it's a connection opportunity. And it's also a good way for them to take on more responsibility in the family. So other ways to connect with kids, it, we, I always recommend special time, which is one one-on-one -on -one time, one parent, one child. If it's you've got little guys, it could be just five or 10 minutes of playing Candyland or um, reading a book. If you have older kids, it could be an hour or two, you know, something where you're really just interacting, doing something that they choose. Family meetings, I mentioned before, an amazing way to connect as a family. We always start our family meetings with appreciations, which is a very specific thing that someone in the family did for you that you really appreciated in the prior week. And it can be hard at first. Our kids may start with, I really appreciate Jamie for not being so annoying last week, right? You get these backhanded compliments. But as the weeks go by, if you have a weekly family meeting, they start to notice how great it feels to be sincerely appreciated for something you did. And they'll start to look around and pay attention and you grow a culture of gratitude in your family and, and, and strengthen those bonds instead of always sort of having that sibling fighting or the nagging from the parents. Um, cuddles and roughhousing games, all of this is a great way to not only connect with your kids, but to inoculate them a little bit against anxiety because whenever you're roughhousing with someone bigger than you, there's a tiny bit of fear that your body just feels. And it's like a little bit of practice at feeling those big feelings that um, all of our kids need right now. So anxiety is the number one challenge facing our young people today. About a third of um, kids are diagnosed with anxiety. So whenever you have a chance to do something a little bit scary, a little bit risky in a safe way, you're building up their tolerance for that. And the last bullet point here, connect before you correct, is one of my secret weapons that when you walk into a room and your kid's doing something they're not supposed to, you want to like yell or bring down the hammer. What are you thinking? And if you do that, you're inviting them into a power struggle. On the other hand, if you can put an arm around them, touch them, be that, have that physical connection and be like, hey, you're on Minecraft again and homework time you are connecting first and then steering them to what they're supposed to be doing. It doesn't mean that you don't have a consequence to that choice. It just means it doesn't have to happen first. Communicating in ways that build self-regulation. There's so many ideas in my book and in other books I'm gonna recommend at the end. Um, whenever we can flip a negative to a positive. So the classic example is instead of yelling, no running, please walk, use your walking feet, right? Giving kids information instead of bossing them helps them to take that one step. It builds their planning, their executive function skills. It helps them to participate in solving a problem, asking questions, asking for help. And the fourth bullet point here, planning and thinking ahead is the one most important thing that all of us can be doing to build our kids' executive function, which the research shows is a better predictor of success in school and life in, in, in job success than IQ. So when our kids have the ability to look ahead, plan ahead, and to reflect, oh, what went wrong? What should I do differently? That is just a continual process that is going to help them so much in life. And I'm a huge fan of notes and signs. If you leave a note about a rule or 
a limit or a reminder, it's so much more effective than verbally telling your kids because again, it doesn't invite them into that um, power struggle. And I learned about communication on my when I was reporting my book, when I went to Vermont and I, I met the Jackson family. And this is um, mom, the mom Bay Jackson with her daughters, Scarlett and Magnolia. And um, Scarlett, Scarlett's just having a total, I'm sorry, that's Magnolia. She's just having a total meltdown. And um, what Bay was con communicating to her was actually nonverbal. She was just holding her, giving her that physical presence that helps our kids to self-regulate and sending her the message that she wasn't gonna melt just because her daughter was having a meltdown, right? Our kids' big emotions aren't too much for us to handle. That's such an important message for us to send, that it's a normal part of childhood to have ups and downs, to you know, get frustrated, to yell, and to make amends. And again, great day for talking about making amends. So the third and most powerful element of all the models of teaching self-regulation is building kids' capacity and their capability. So um, household chores are a great way. If you've got little kids, they love to help. One of the first things a toddler says is, I do it myself, right? And it takes more time, but whenever we can enlist them, we are going to help them build that sense of I'm capable, I can help and, um, and, and to lay the foundation for mental health. Um, the second bullet point here is a, another one I learned when I was reporting my book is whenever we see our kids doing something a little bit in the direction that we would like, we wanna notice it and anchor that trait so they start to see themselves in a different way. So maybe you've got a kid as I once did who did not like to share. Instead of always focusing on please share, why don't you share, be more generous. If you see a tiny little thing like, oh my gosh, you got five gumballs and you gave one to your sibling, look at the big smile on their face. That's what I call generous, right? That starts to help them see when they are being that way that you're hoping to build on. So um, our kids are much more capable than we often think. Here again is the Jackson family in Vermont and this four-year-old girl is using a knife about this long, cutting walnuts. And her mom's nearby, she's not bossing her, directing her, saying, watch out, be careful. She's just there available, but she's already taught her how to use a knife and she's seeing her execute it. And you know your kids best. Not every four-year-old can use a giant kitchen knife to cut walnuts, but this one could. And when we let our kids do things that maybe we weren't sure they could, we all get this sense of wonder at how much they really can do. So last but not least, in fact, possibly the most important is we need to find those moments of joy with our kids. And often these parenting talks are all about like negotiations, routines, schedules. We need to balance this out with just those opportunities to have family game night, to play games, to create traditions. And I saw a ton of ideas on social media for just being silly with our kids no matter what the you know pandemic conditions are, this was a indoor, um, uh, I think it was a treasure hunt or scavenger hunt, and um, and it can go a long way. So in addition to these sort of bare minimum parenting standards, in these difficult times, I think it's a great opportunity to to amp up our game to try to learn new skills. So um, whenever we can use reflective listening, use empathy, um, reframe our kids' negative attributes to be positive. And this is in our own heads, right? I have one kid who's super stubborn. She's gonna be an amazing CEO someday. No one is gonna push her around. So even in our own minds, if we can start to think of our kids in a different way, it opens the door for them to be different as well. Um, one risky thing every day is a great uh, tool for kids who are prone to anxiety because it helps them build up that tolerance. And whenever we're trying new things or want our kids to be different, we want to always just invite them. We're not going to always get their willing participation, but just keep inviting and do things with your kids as much as possible. Another thing that has really helped me in the last 18 months is to think about coping skills. So when we think about self-care, people are often talking about mindfulness. You may have heard of box breathing where you breathe in and out for the same amount of time that helps to really calm and regulate your body or meditation. And I'm, I'm not a very successful meditator. So I've turned to these other categories of coping skills that are often just as useful. And this can go in that choose your own adventure last um, 
last um, bullet point for your for your self care. So um, there's a lot of material. I I, I will uh, share the, share the slides. This is my stockpile that I had um, 18 months ago for the pandemic. I hope that this talk has given you some new tools for making it through the, the this new stage. And if there's only one thing you take from this, I hope it's that any difficult behavior from our kids isn't a sign that there's something wrong or you're failing as a parent. It's this invitation to get curious, use that scientist mindset to try to understand how, what will help them to better manage their thoughts, behavior, and emotions. And it may be a signal that they're ready for more responsibility or you need a change in your routine. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions either now or you're welcome to email me later, connect with me on social media. Um, I really value being connected with you all and um, and also wanted to share this, which is my book and a couple other books that I think are really valuable with some great hands-on activities uh, for kids. So happy to take a question or two in the minute I, we have left. Well, if, if nobody has a question, I will just say that, you know, and I, I've got, kids who are older so that was super eye-opening to me <laughs> i think um, sue may have had a question oh please well i mean i don't it's kind of hard to um think of a question but i appreciate what you were saying about um you know the pandemic um my son 18 months uh my 11 year old has had some a lot of problems with school refusal and he didn't go to school for 18 months, um, they made the mistake of putting him in the afternoon pod. And so the morning he's got anticipatory anxiety at all the neuro testing and blah, blah, blah. And now, um, you know, it's third day of school and he's, I mean, he ran away the first day a couple times. Yeah. He's now yeah. in middle, middle school. So I'm not sure what to, you know, like just take things slow, I guess. Um, yeah, baby steps. You're going to just, um, so with, with anxiety and school refusal, it's just about building up their tolerance. Yeah. And I would, I'm sure you have uh, professionals who are helping you. So I'd like yes. definitely rely on them. But I think the most important thing for you is to manage your own sense. I'm guessing this is really stressful for you and hard to see him in this crisis, right? That he's not able to do the things that kids should be doing at this age. And it's and for you to figure out how am I going to be that strong rock that he can rely on, so that I'm not panicking when he runs away again, right? That I can send him that message: we're going to get through this together, right? Yeah. You, you know, yeah. it's it's really scary to see your kid when they're really struggling, and whatever you need to be able to say to him: yeah, you know what? It didn't go as planned. I'm disappointed. I want these things for you. And you'll get there when you get there, right? There's no rush. Life is not a race. He doesn't have to do it this fall. He can do it next fall, right? I have, I have relatives who are a year or two behind in school and they're going to have successful lives, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the end. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. Yeah, Definitely feel, definitely. feel free to, to follow up by email because um, I, I, I know I have colleagues who are dealing with so much school refusal right now and over the last year, he's not yeah. alone for sure. Do you do consultations? I, yes, I'm a little bit busy right now. So I might refer you to a, to a colleague, but definitely feel free to be in touch. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Uh, so helpful, uh, I'm sure. And many of us can uh, share it in turn and certainly with your contact information. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to see everyone. I'm sorry we didn't have more time, but I know there's a lot of other amazing programming from the other talks that I saw listed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.